Christ is risen. Pascha is the center of our liturgical calendar. Everything leads up to it. And then once we pass through the night celebrating and all of that, everything after is reflecting back towards it. So it's the, the center of our whole liturgical calendar in life. And you could actually say it in another way, and it would also be true, that it's the beginning of everything for us, including not the least of which is the gospel book on the altar. We end right right at the end, right before, at the end of Holy Week, we're at the very back of that big covered gospel book, and that very first thing of the first new day of the day of the resurrection, we turn all the way to page one. It's kind of dramatic for the priest and deacon. We like going back to the beginning of the big book. So... <laughs> Pascha is good for lots of things, but also going back to the beginning, for sure. And the church today wants us to, in the next few weeks, reflect on Pascha and to be enlightened, to see what's there, to not let it go. Remember my warning. I told you, don't call me on bright Monday, the Monday after Pascha, and say, now that Pascha is over. It's like, don't. You know, we're just now sort of getting into it, you know? We're just now getting into what does this mean? Last week, we heard about Thomas tripping over joy. I read that poem, tripping over joy, because he had become amazed, really, at the, the, the move that Christ had made by rising from the dead. That poem calls the spiritual life a sublime chess game, you may remember. This week, the church wants to call to mind all those that were involved in the burial of Jesus. In the weeks going forth, we're going to see, we're going to see the power of the resurrection going forth. What does it mean in the life of the believer? But today, the church wants us to see what happened at the burial of Jesus and what happened to those involved. So today, we had the gospel reading reflecting on Joseph of Arimathea. Nicodemus, and most especially the holy myrrh-bearing women. And the count's always, by the way, a little, it's either seven or eight myrrh-bearing women, depending on whether or not you include the Theotokos in the list. So I've seen a list where Mary, the Theotokos, is in the list, and a list where she's not. But Mary Magdalene, Mary the Theotokos, Joanna, Salome, Mary the wife of Clopas, Susanna, Mary of Bethany, and her sister Martha of Bethany. <laughs> And many of the women in our community are named for one of these women. And when Jesus was crucified, these eight women, or seven depending on the count, and two men did something for God. Which is a little weird if you think about it. The way we're used to thinking about it is that God has to do stuff for us. <coughs> exactly. <laughs> we're pretty used to the idea that we don't do anything for God God does stuff for us we pray and he kind of it's like a deal we made somehow we pray and he's got to basically answer those prayers and do what we want and then we just have this expectation God is always going to be doing stuff for us it's not that that's so completely wrong it's just one sided at least it's one-sided. What do we find today? Joseph of Arimathea, he goes to Pilate. He asks at the risk of his own life, certainly at the risk of his career, and I hope you think about that for all of us who don't want to risk our careers. Joseph of Arimathea risks his career as a council member asking for the body of Jesus to give him a proper burial. Nicodemus risked his own livelihood as well by publicly coming out on the side of Jesus and bringing spices. And of course, the holy myrrh-bearing women on that very early glorious first day of the resurrection bring spices. And they must have thought, they must have thought that going to the tomb that morning was not going to be the first day of the glorious resurrection. They must have thought that that was going to be the first day of a whole lot of days of despair and defeat. But they went anyway, knowing the rock that was rolled in front of the tomb was so large they couldn't do anything about it, they still went. 
All of these are doing something out of the love for God. They had absolutely no expectation that anything good would come of it. And they were, on the contrary, endangering themselves. And they went. So what if today we changed our way of approaching God from he has done and will do something for me to what beautiful and maybe difficult thing could I do for God out of love for him? We would just change the question instead of what is God going to do for me today? Or why hasn't God done this for me today? I asked for this and he doesn't give me what I want. And then make an appointment with the priest to tell me about it. And I sit there and go, I know. He doesn't do what we want sometimes. Um, that's why you don't like pay me by the hour for those meetings. Like you pay a counselor. But what if we changed... What if we change the question from why hasn't God helped me to what am I going to do for out of love for God? What am I going to do? What difficult thing or what beautiful thing can I, can, can I do? Is it time to forgive? Is it time to confess? Is it time to give up the habit that's hurting us or those around us? Is it time to really begin to fast and pray? Has that time finally come? Where we go, you know what, I'm going to do something out of the love. It's okay, Henry. Just don't have to voice today like a normal voice. Is it time to do something out of our love for God? Are we willing to finally do something more? Even maybe something difficult. Instead of always saying, Lord, help me, help me, help me. Can we look out like Joseph, Nicodemus, and the holy myrrh-bearing women and say, what will I do out of my love for God? What can I do? And there's some certain like the spiritual disciplines, fasting and prayer, the liturgy, and you're here. And what else? What else is being asked of us? All of this work is difficult. And frankly, much of what we want to do for God might be beyond our own power. And I think this comes to the point where we have to, if you will allow it, admit something and be honest. And that is living the Christian life is difficult. And actually, we don't get much support outside of this community and maybe our Christian friends around us outside of this community. Really don't get a lot of like push to keep going for it. There's not a lot of like sitting at the coffee shop or whatever and someone come up and he goes, what have you done out of love of God today? It's just not the question you're going to get. And we have to be willing to admit that Christianity is difficult and not like we have been told sometimes that it is easy and painless and a solution to our problems. We may even believe that a little bit. We have to fight against that. That fits more with why hasn't God helped me? Why doesn't God give me what I want all the time? That kind of Christianity is not of Jesus. It's of the world. Following Christ is beautiful. And it is worthwhile, and it is our very life, but it is often filled with disappointment and pain and suffering and all kinds of stuff that we might not pick. In short, the cross. Things we might say, take it from me. We'd like a life of ease and comfort and luxury, and what the Lord demands often is more along the lines of sacrifice and honesty and being vulnerable and even conflict is what he wants at times, and a life dedicated to loving others. All the others, even the mean others, the downright mean others. And this is really hard, a commitment not to be taken lightly. So unfortunately, many of us are afraid, and many of, of just the Christian world is afraid to admit this, and we become experts at putting up a facade that it's perfect to be a Christian, and that Christianity is easy, and the Lord will give us what we ask if we just ask in the right way. If we could get the formula down, he would do what we want all of the time. And this is not what we find, right? Not what I find. He so often is so closer, more generous than we can ask. But other times he doesn't give us everything. So if you'll allow me to go further, I'll say even this, that more than 
mean people and difficult circumstances making it difficult to follow Jesus, that he's actually somehow in that stuff. He is in the difficult sibling that we have, the difficult business partner we've gotten into partnership with. He is in the difficult circumstances. The losing the job, the health scare, and whatever. Jesus is not only like sort of outside it, being compassionate about it. He's actually involved in it. So I know of a man that had a dream, and he told my friend the dream who told me, and this is the dream. And I quote, I had a dream a while back. In the dream, I was being pulled down a white water rapid that was thrashing, and there was torrential rain coming down on the river. And I was thinking to myself, I'm going to die. I was aware of being fully full of fear. In the thrashing about trying to stay afloat, my wrist hit something, and I thought, I assumed, it was a branch in the water. I grabbed it, and it turned out to be one of those pool ladders that sticks all the way out, this one all the way into the riverbank. I grabbed it, pulled myself in exhausted. I looked back at the river thinking, that was lucky, for sure I would have died. And then I woke up. And he goes on. My adrenaline was going so much, my heart was literally pounding, and I got up. It was 3.30 in the morning, and I came to the church to keep the Lord company, he says. And while I was thinking about this dream, I heard by faith, what do you think of the dream? This man thought the Lord had kind of asked him, what do you think of the dream? And I thought it was fortunate the ladder handle was there, or I might not have been able to get out and save my life. And the Lord said, by faith, the man thinks he hears, what if I told you that the river was me? That's the scandal of the cross. We look at the cross and say, the Lord is not in the cross. We want to just see resurrection and ascension. Resurrection and ascension. Like if we could just do resurrection and ascension all year round, instead of the cross all year round, and we do the cross all year round, that would be better. We look at the cross and say, the Lord can't be in that cross. He's not in the river. The river is really dangerous, and we're not going to make it out alive. The Lord's not in the river. And we know that if we look at the cross, we have to say, maybe the Lord is the river. Maybe the Lord is in the river, which is a, a shift. Let's remember today's gospel. Let's remember the women who go to the tomb early. They have no idea what they're going to do to get the stone out of the way, and they go. They do their part. Everything was against them. Everything was against Joseph of Arimathea. Everything was against Nicodemus. And they went doing something wonderfully difficult for God, out of love for God. And when they did this, they found that the barriers had been removed and they met him. He meets them, literally meets them, the women that go. The good news is that because of the death, of his death on the cross, and his glorious resurrection and ascension from the dead and his ascension from earth to heaven, he meets us no matter what we're facing. But the truth is also that he's actually in what we are facing. Not just constantly taking us out of everything difficult to make our life easy. He's actually sometimes in all of that difficult stuff. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is risen! Christ is risen.